Hey, welcome to the Lincoln Network podcast, where you can find a wide variety of conversations on technology, democracy, and congressional reform in Washington, D.C. You can watch these conversations on YouTube, and you can also find them wherever you listen to your podcasts. Hello, everyone. My name is Alexia Jordan. I am the Innovation, Cyber, and National Security Analyst for Lincoln Network. And on today's podcast, I am very excited to host Mr. Stuart A. Baker. Stuart, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Alexia. It's great to be on. <laughs> um, so I'm going to put your information and links to your books and all your things in the show notes. Um, but I was hoping you could give us just a quick background of yourself so that people know what fantastic of a human being we're talking to today. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. But uh, uh, what I say, I'm, I have a podcast, the Cyberlaw Podcast, and I sometimes introduce myself as... Uh, holding the record for coming back to practice law more times at Steptoe and Johnson than any other lawyer. Because <laughs> I, I, I keep coming and then somebody offers me a job in government and I say, oh, that sounds like it'll be interesting. And I go into government, and then I come back and I go back and because somebody else has offered me a job. So I've been doing that my whole career since 19... 78, I went to Steptoe, and in 1979, I left them to go to the government, and uh, I've been doing it ever since. So <laughs> kinds of, you might wonder, what kinds of jobs have I done? They've, they've mostly been national security and uh, homeland security. I was uh, the general counsel of the National Security Agency in the 90s, uh, when nobody knew what it was. Uh, I went back into government to try to figure out how we got our uh, intelligence about Iraqi WMD so completely wrong. Uh, wrote a long report uh, along with a lot of very talented people. Um, then went to the Department of Homeland Security to help them stand up a policy office. And I was the first assistant secretary to do that. Um, a, and came out, wrote a book called Skating on Stilts about what it's like to do that. Um, and then started the podcast. Uh, and I've been doing the podcast for five or six years. Uh, really enjoy it. Uh, I really um, appreciate all the preparation that goes into it. And you've obviously uh, absorbed that lesson. You did a great job getting ready for this one. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. And um, just for all the listeners, I really want to emphasize this cyber law podcast. Um, you know, it started in 2015, and he regularly hosts the coolest techies, lawyers, security apparatus people from America, Europe, just like all across the globe. Um, please check it out online, Spotify, Apple, wherever you like to get your podcasts. And um, Stuart, I, I really have to mention this because I think the other coolest thing about you is your personal love for biotech. Um, I did my undergrad in molecular and cellular biology. And when I read that about you, I was like, this is my guy. This is fantastic. It's, it is. It's a very, it's, it's, it's exciting and scary as hell. Uh, <laughs> uh, the kinds of things that biotech can do uh, will transform our lives uh, in good ways and bad. Couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. Um, so maybe we can talk about that on a later podcast today. We are here to talk about U.S. tech firms in China, telecom security in general, and kind of foreign policy. Um, so I'd like to start from like the super, super tippy top, Stuart, um, just to give people a little context in our modern relationships with China, our modern relationship with China. Um, you know, it's, it's dating back about 50 years, actually, 2021, yeah. Um, you know, in 71, Nixon announced that he was traveling to China in 87. Reagan made the first mention of a top US priority, you know, being is being friends with China and, and building relationship with them. And then since then, every mention of China and our national security strategy reports has been in the same vein. Like, let's make friends. It'll be good for democracy. And especially with the growth of the internet, the prevailing narrative was that American tech firms would help liberalize China economically and value-wise. Um, then in the Obama years, we see this like decreased patience with some of China's behavior as they rise on the international stage. And I'm kind of hoping you can like give us a little background on what happened here. Like why now all of a sudden do everyday Americans regularly see and hear negative news associated with China? Okay, yeah, so the short answer is because China deserves it, but uh, the, there's a longer answer, uh, and I'm sort of embarrassed that I've lived through all that history that you talked about. <laughs> so. <laughs> it's 
you're not the only one. You're not the only one. That's why you're so poised to talk about it. I knew I was like, we need to show that this is how it went. Okay. So I, but I, I, I think you're right. Uh, uh, there was, um, look, a lot of this was influenced by the fact that we won the Cold War with, you know, only paying half attention. I, I, we, we, believed that we had a message and were selling a product democracy that was way superior to what the Soviets were offering. Um, and then we kind of went to sleep on it and uh, we didn't let the Soviets win, but we, we, did, we didn't work hard to, to win that battle. And it, it just happened, right? In 1989, wall comes down. Uh, uh, by 1992, Russia has completely transformed its government. Uh, and the lesson we learned from that is um, if you are patient and you are pushing for democracy, in the long run, you're going to win that fight. Uh, and so with that lesson learned, um, China doesn't transform itself immediately. They've had uh, the Tiananmen Square. They've had a, a brutal uh, crackdown. Um, and so uh, everybody was nervous about it, but the assumption was in the long run, if we're just patient, uh, the Chinese will go through the same process that the Russians went through. I, and the, the problem for us is the Chinese understood that lesson too. And they said, what do we have to do to make sure we don't go through that same process? Uh, and she, uh, the president, she is really transformed by Tiananmen and watching the Soviets collapse. Uh, and he has been working very hard to make sure that that can't happen inside China. Uh, while China was learning that lesson and building its strength against the kind of uh, democratizing uh, pressure that we had brought to uh, uh, Russia, uh, we, First, we're getting, uh, you know, I won't say getting rich, but companies were making an enormous amount of money as China opened, buying stuff made in China, having things made in China, the arbitrage between what it costs to, to uh, buy a product in the United States and what it costs to make it in China was enormous. Companies just rushed in. Uh, and I had some clients uh, like Motorola that just uh, made money hand over fist in the 90s because it was a they had a product of so mobile phones that everybody in China wanted and they uh, were able to uh, dominate that market for a while. Mm -hmm. And then what happened is 9-11 happened. We stopped worrying at a geopolitical level about competing with China. Uh, we had started with the assumption everybody was making so much money. It was really comfortable to believe, of course, uh, we can make a whole bunch of money and do good for the world by slowly introducing all these new technologies, all of this new information to a previously closed society. And we know from watching the Soviet Union how that will end up. And by God, we're getting rich. So by 1999, 2000, that policy was on autopilot. And so 9-11 happens and we can just we say, well, we'll just leave that policy uh, on the back burner and we'll worry about terrorism for the next 10 years. And that's what we did. Uh, and you know, uh, that, that was really, that took us through the Bush, the, the, the second Bush administration. Uh, Obama comes in, he is still carrying on the war on terror, but he's looking around at how the world has changed. And he notices that, that uh, the back burner policy doesn't seem to be making a lot of progress with China. Uh, and in fact, they're getting more and more confrontational about more and more things. The assumption that they would see that the basic post-war order of liberalized interdependent e economics had made everybody rich and they'd want to join. They, they weren't signing up to that. They said, well, we'd like to get rich, but we'd also like to control the critical markets that are important to our defense uh, and we'll do whatever it takes to control them. And we don't care about your um, WTO principles. Um, that all became, I think, pretty clear after they got past the uh, China, the Beijing Olympics, which they wanted to get through without any fuss. And once they got through with it, 
uh, there was an economic crisis and they said, you know, you're not, you guys aren't that good at this economic stuff. Why should we be listening to you? Uh, and that was a change for China that we finally noticed. Uh, and yet the, uh, there were so many companies making so much money in China, they really did not want to see the policy change. But what then finally started to happen during the Obama years was company after company realized that it was a bonanza for a decade. And then the Chinese government said, well, thank you very much for helping to create our domestic industry. Now that our domestic industry is strong, we don't need you anymore. We're going to put you out of business here. And then soon our companies are going to put you out of business around the world. Uh, and as people began to realize that this was not a long-term relationship, but a, you know, a one night stand, uh, they got much less invested in trying to maintain a good relationship with the, um, between the US and China over the, uh, uh, the long term. And so as people have proposed policies that were hostile to China in Washington, there are fewer and fewer companies that want to stand up and say, hey, this is bad for us. We really believe in the old policy. Um, and uh, uh, that has meant that suddenly, uh, and I, I think it took President Trump to show us this, the whole edifice of let's all get along, this is gonna be great for everybody, that whole consensus collapsed. Trump said, we're gonna to have to fight with China over economic issues and everything else. Um, and this is the one area where he has totally transformed the company, the country and our policies, and we're not going back. Uh, that said, there are a, company, a couple of companies, Apple is certainly one of them, that are still making money hand over fist in China and are also dependent on them for uh, their supply chain. Um, but they increasingly look very lonely. Uh, and I think they're going to discover sooner or later that they just can't, uh, you know, you, you kind of imagine somebody who's got one foot on the dock and one foot in a rowboat. And the rowboat is slowly moving out to sea and, you know, they're <laughs> stretching and they're still, you know, they're still standing, but, but you know where this is going. <laughs> Oh my God, I am I am so excited to have you here. You, I, I'm gonna just say it again. You guys really need to listen to this man podcast. You guys think that he has jokes now? He has jokes on. I think you guys are on episode like what, 366? 66. I just put 67 in the can, yeah. There you go, there you go. Um, so that's actually a really great segue to my next question. Um, you just kind of like the, the, the light history slash trajectory of American tech firms and their relationship with China. Um, so it makes total sense. I mean, just from a completely like objective standpoint, it makes total sense for businesses, any businesses anywhere to want to tap into China's like what, $60 billion a year market, depending on what you do. Um, and of course, just like us, China has their own national rules that they might, that they make companies abide by. And, you know, again, of course that makes sense. Um, but I really can't recall a time where we had to think so strategically and now like legislatively about the loyalties of US companies to money versus American values. And, and so many tech companies over the decades have caved to China's national rules that are in direct opposition to what we've been spouting for X amount of decades, like you just said, right? Um, like Cisco helped build the Great Firewall and in increase their sale of routers and Yahoo and Microsoft, Apple, Google have all caved multiple times to China's censorship by banning VPNs or handing over personal information of people who don't like China. And even more recently, as we've all moved to Zoom, you know, it's closed accounts of Chinese, of US-based Chinese dissidents. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm not even sure how we are supposed to be thinking about this uh, because we, we just haven't had to do this before. Um, what, are, what are your kind of your, your thoughts about that, about making businesses choose between loyalty versus American values? I personally believe that some care more about American values than money, but there's also people that feel the direct opposite. But now we're in a position where it's affecting our national security and our, our, our positioning worldwide. And, yeah, this is this is a this is a problem, and it's a uh, it's a really tricky one. We've never had a state directed economy where um, it, this large to deal with, 
and, and the size of the economy makes a difference. Uh, I, I think the, the way they've handled most the motion picture industry is uh, very, very clever and hard for us to deal with because they have essentially said, uh, we're mostly gonna make our own pictures, but Hollywood, we're glad to have a certain number of pictures from Hollywood every year. But if you wanna be in that number, we really wanna like you. And if we don't like you, you're just not gonna make it. So it's a very vague statement. Everybody is looking to, everybody in Hollywood wants to do whatever it takes to make sure that they have not made China angry at them. Uh, and that, that means that what China likes is not just a matter of government policy. You submit your, um, uh, your picture and they say, well, you need to cut this scene or that scene. Uh, you have to think from the day you start casting it, what will China think if we put this movie star in our picture? Has he ever said anything about Tibet? Uh, and when they start thinking that way, nobody's going to start talking about Tibet because they still want to be in pictures. Um, and so that, uh, that subtle process uh, has an enormous impact across the ecosystem. And what can the US government do about this? What, if they tried to say to uh, Hollywood, no, you, you can't uh, make every single picture a propaganda picture uh, for the Chinese Communist Party uh, just to make them like you better. Uh, that's contrary to American values. They would say, excuse me, but we have a First Amendment. You can't tell us what to do. Uh, you can't tell us what message there should be. Uh, and this is, this is a persistent problem as we're discovering that the First Amendment principles we have uh, actually enables government control of uh, American speech by every government except ours. Uh, it, 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 Baidu. Uh, Baidu was sued not so long ago, well, it was probably eight, 10 years ago now. They were sued because when you searched, sort of like the, uh, the Tank Man search that Bing, where Bing produced no pictures of the famous Tank Man standing in front of the tanks on uh, uh, Tiananmen Square, um, it, it, there was a, uh, it, people searched Baidu uh, for Tiananmen Square on June 18, I guess. Uh, and Baidu produced a bunch of pictures of tourists having a fine time in Tiananmen Square. And there was not a single article that mentioned what had happened there. Yeah. And they were sued uh, for failing to provide that information. And they said, excuse me, we have a First Amendment right to decide what search and, uh, returns we're going to provide. And mm -hmm. so uh, they were able, they were obviously responding to Chinese government censorship. Uh, so they were effectuating Chinese government censorship and then telling us it was a matter of First Amendment rights to do it. So finding a way to deal with that through government and laws is going to be very hard. It really does depend on consumers in the United States saying to the National Basketball Association, you know, WTF, you know, I, uh, you're, you're selling out the people of Hong Kong, you're selling out the people of Tibet, you're selling out your uh, players just to make more money, you know, uh, how can, you know, how can you do that to, in a context where um, the most weaponized forms of racism are being deployed uh, by the uh, government that is telling you not to talk. Uh, that's, that, you know, it's it, the, the players should be ashamed of themselves. The league should be ashamed of itself, but they'll only be ashamed of itself if it hears from the uh, fans in the United States. Mm. So we're going to get to that in a bit because um, I definitely have some words about 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 this topic. Um, but I'm, I'm really interested in, in the way that you frame this because it seems as though, and this is what I've seen, is that there's been like this evolution of foreign affairs. Um, so to me, Beijing and, and their increased influence over the globe um, has taken this definition of foreign policy to, like to a new level, right? So like usually we keep disagreements um, between countries to like trade commerce, you know, um, treaties, we're not going to sign this treaty, we fight about it. Um, but like you mentioned, this this brazen exertion of leverage over US culture um, has has just been very, very crazy. You cited like the NBA, um, or when John Cena, the, the 
pro wrestler apologize oh, yeah. China like in public for calling Taiwan a country um you know just this just these individuals in the United States that are somehow a part of some type of company like the the little boy who was a video game player and, and the American gaming company Blizzard had to ban him because he he said that you know good for he, Hong Kong he, protesting exactly his solidarity with Hong Kong yeah I look I this is what happened in Hong Kong is appalling precisely because we're so quiet about it. They just shut uh, the, the the biggest newspaper that opposes uh, the Chinese Communist Party. They just, the Hong Kong government just shut it. And this has happened, I'm mean, sure we noticed, but I, I don't think that the Chinese have learned from this the lesson that it's hard or painful to invade and suppress uh, um, uh, the views that uh, in neighboring states that they don't like. Uh, it's a bad lesson for Taiwan, that's for sure. Um, so yeah, I, I think it, it is true that the, uh, uh, the Chinese government is much more aggressive about cultural and um, uh, speech issues than others, but not really more than the Communist Party in Russia was. It's just they have more power to make it happen. To, to punish people in big ways and small, you know, they have a, a, a social credit score in China in which everything you do, every view you express, whether you stand and salute, whether you tweet in favor of the government, all of that influences your credit score for things like uh, whether you get uh, uh, tickets to, to fly to places. And there is something like that for U.S. companies and increasingly for U.S. individuals in which you kind of know that China is keeping score every day. And uh, that influences people um, in a way that the Communist Party of Russia never could have. Uh, we're going to have to learn to deal with that and respond to it. I, uh, and part of it is, I think, we're going to have to recognize that there are a whole bunch of us and a lot of companies that just aren't going to make much money in China, and they should get used to the idea uh, and um, find ways to make sure that the Chinese companies that are making money and making compromises don't get to use those closed markets as a way to build up the kind of monopoly profits that allow them to com compete in the West on an even, uh, well, in a, in a way that is thoroughly one-sided. So this is, um, this, this leads really well into kind of like my next two questions. I'm going to blend them because um, it's very rare that I hear someone say, we need to start pulling our U.S. companies aside and being like, look, I know you guys thought that all this money was about to come from China, but we need to figure this out. And like having that conversation, you know, because I think a lot of us are trying to figure out like, what is the policy, U.S. policy apparatus even supposed to do? What is a president? two presidents, three presidents supposed to be doing about this. Um, and, in, 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 and kind of in addition to that, you know, just this, this problem being so much larger than a party, Republican, Democrat, a, a president or two or three presidents, a legislature or two. Um, I'm wondering from your perspective, um, do you think US companies even consider this type of behavior from China bullying? Like when athletes are forced to apologize and Apple is forced to give up their VPNs, you know, to counter US norms. Like, do you get this sense from people that you know in the tech industry and people that you know that are kind of um, in these relationships with China that their firm's public statements feel negatively about their decision? And I'm kind of wondering this because I think that this nuance is important because if they feel bullied, then it seems more natural to think, okay, US president, Congress, we need to step up, we need to protect them because they feel sad that they're getting bullied and they actually didn't want to give up the VPNs. They were kind of forced. Or, you know, do, do, do we not think about it that way because maybe a lot of companies actually don't care about American loyalties. They were like, hey, they're supposed to do it. I did it. Yep, yeah. and I'm rich, I'm richer, so. I, so you guys, yeah. I didn't sign up to be a businessman, to be a president. I signed up to make money and that's what it was. I think it's a mix. Look, I, I, we don't give Google enough credit for what it did in 2010 when it basically said, uh, we're not going to censor our search results uh, in right. China. We're just, we're just leaving. Yeah. Uh, they gave up an enormous uh, uh, opportunity to make a whole bunch of money there. 
Uh, and, uh, and, you know, it, it helps when one of the two founders of the company um, uh, was raised partly in the Soviet Union and knows what the system is like, and it helped that the Chinese had uh, broken into their network and tried to steal information from them, but it was still a very brave uh, uh, move, and one that I'm not sure that a company is completely happy about. They, they lost a lot of money. I, uh, they probably would be making what Google, what to Apple is making if they'd stayed. Um, so I think what you see inside companies is you see a debate. You see people who say, let's get realistic, which is code for, I don't care that much about US uh, 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 values. I've got to make money. This is, you know, these guys have the power to, to hurt us. And so we have to bend to them. Uh, you also see a lot of people who say, I know we have to do what we're told, but let's make them be absolutely clear. Let's not embrace what they are asking us to do. Let's do it slowly and haltingly and reluctantly. Uh, but you know, the, the, the Chinese have figured that game out. They, they know how to get people to do it. I, I, and once people have done it once slowly and haltingly, it gets easier and easier to do it the second and third and fourth time. So, uh, and I have noticed uh, in dealing with companies in, the, in Silicon Valley that when they talk about the policies of other countries, they are complete cultural relativists. They say, oh, well, every country has its own values. And, mm. and the, who are we to tell them what they should think and do? Ooh. And then when they talk about the United States and, and they talk about policies here, there's none of that. It's right. Those doofuses in Washington, we've got to tell them how to do this right. We've got to change their policy. And, and you see that with Apple, right? Uh, they end up doing what the Chinese government wants them to do, and they keep quiet about it. And I'm sure they say, well, you know, who are we to say? But they don't say that when Louis Free says, cough up the, the, the data about these terrorist tel telephones. They say, no, no, that's just wrong. And we have a view on that, and our morality requires that we fight it. So I, I do kind of think that this is partly, this is partly educational. I, if you if you grow up hearing this cultural relativism stuff from people who also have very firm views about how the US government ought to be run, that's, that's the way you establish your values. And I'm afraid a lot of people, like places like Google and Apple and uh, Facebook, have that fundamental uh, problem. They, they, they aren't quite comfortable saying, I'm an American and I stand for American values. Um, I, and at the same time, uh, they feel I have to do these things that uh, uh, other countries want me to do. And you end up with folks who talk about preserving American values, but don't do it very enthusiastically. And I, yeah, we're, we're stuck there. That, that, that's partly because uh, patriotism is not a completely respectable view in Silicon Valley in the way it is in Houston, Texas. Yeah, you know, I'm gonna have to give out another uh, shout out. So I'm not sure if you've heard about the Realignment Podcast, which is a podcast that's sponsored by Lincoln Network, that's hosted by um, our director of outreach, Marshall Kosloff, and his, his co-host Sager. Sager. Um, but they, they talk about the realignment and the purpose of the entire podcast is that there is a realignment of the political ideas of America. Like what one might have considered Republican and Democrat Democratic back in the day is like no longer. And these issues, just like what we're currently talking about, do not fit on any party lines. They no. don't fit on any like one ideological spectrum. And even, you know, even more so the, their point of the podcast and they bring in all these really great people is to show the, the, you that we need to start adjusting to this, to this, to this like realignment. Um, and I, I don't know, maybe I can like 
put you into their show at some point. Yeah. I'm, sure they would have, like, I'm sure they would have great questions for you because now we're sitting here. So if, you know, what you're saying is completely true. I used to work for um, a consulting firm full of uh, folks that were comprised of the national security apparatus and they, they, they work in Silicon Valley. You know, this is, this is their, that's, that's their spot. That's their space. And I experienced this, the same thing. So now we're about to get this different, this different type of patriotism that's raising up that I recall hearing my parents and my grandparents talking about. Um, and I just think that this is very interesting that this is all going to come along the lines of tech and, 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 and the evolutions that come with it in a way that's like pro-business, but hard on national security. But also you need to be like really cultural because diversity, but also really patriotic because like America and you know it's just it's yeah. very very interesting and this is why I love this side topic yeah no I, I I completely agree with you there is a realignment uh, going on uh, um, I <clears throat> I was actually talking to somebody about the importance of I wanted to organize a uh, uh, an effort to come up with uh, rules for use of national security authorities um, to make sure that no one thought they could be misused for partisan purposes. Uh, mm -hmm. And I said, we ought to get uh, put together a bipartisan. No, we need to, we're going to need a tripartisan uh, uh, approach to this because, you know, there, there, are, there are Democrats, there are old Bush traditional national security Republicans, and there are Trump Republicans, and they are all completely different parties. Yeah. I couldn't agree with you more. And, you know, I just, this is just a little side note, but I'm glad that you said like tripartisan. I'm, I'm, I'm darn near tired of the word bipartisan. Yeah, because um, it, what it means is we elites got together and decided how you should live your life. <laughs> exactly. You know, and I, and I'm also, I can't say that this is a fully fleshed out Alexia opinion. Um, but, you know, I, it used to seem cool that we had two parties. Um, and I, I remember growing up, I was just kind of like taught you know, maybe this was just like American bias for my teachers, but it was like, oh yeah, you know, over there in Europe, they have entirely too many parties. Like, oof, that's why. That's why, you know, when you only got two. And and now it's 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 just it's it's very confusing. Now I'm just like, look, a political period. And I'm gonna need to see a a, a transcript of you behaving like a normal human being. <laughs> like I'm going to see a transcript of you respecting people of all breaths before I'm going to let you on this apolitical thing that is very important for us to establish these type of rules that you're talking about. But um, yes, <laughs> side note. Yes. Side note. <laughs> all right. Um, well, so we got we got off on a tangent, but it was fun. I know. I know. I know. So. Um, where did where did we leave off at? Oh, you were talking about we were talking about Apple. We were talking about you know how U.S. companies kind of deal with patriotism versus business. Um, so I have I have I have two questions, um, and I'm probably going to start with just the example of like San Bernardino. Um, you know, we all know, unfortunately, just so many people died in 2015 uh, due to the shootings, and that was like a huge encryption debate because the FBI, like like you said, Americans ask for X, and tech companies are incredulous. How dare you? privacy, <laughs> you know, and Apple was very, very resistant to giving FBI information that they just knew was going to be key to solving, solving, solving this crime and this, this, this domestic terrorist attack. Um, and once we found out what they were doing in China, you know, we all looked at Apple like, oh, so you guys do give up information, huh? Yeah. <laughs> you know, so I'm wondering if companies actually think, you know, do, in your opinion, of course, it's your opinion. Do you think that they truly believe that it that they have a long run shot in China that they are willing to, you know, kind of shit in the in the in their own house because they are just so confident that they're going to have this market in China, you know, or, you know, like, do 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 you conversely think that Beijing will allow tech firms to stay that long in their in their market? Because so the, I don't I I think first the Chinese now have made it clear that if you're going to be a communications or tech company in their space, you're going to have to enable their power. Uh, and I, 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 Apple has had to give up bits of its preferred solution uh, one at a time, but there's almost nothing left to their privacy protective approach for their uh, in China. Uh, it, 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 there's, there's no illusion 
that the government can't get anything they want about somebody uh, who's using an Apple phone in China. Um, it, so, and I think that we're going to see WhatsApp struggle with that if they want to offer end-to-end -end encryption. They're just not going to do business in China. Uh, Signal is not going to do business in China. Uh, they, so those companies that want to do that are going to be operating outside of China and a large chunk of the rest of the world. Um, it, the, so I don't think that people are saying, I'm going to do this in order to um, improve my relationship with China. China knows what it wants. And if you're going to give it to them, you'll, you'll get whatever China is offering. Otherwise, you won't. Um, what's interesting about the San Bernardino debate, it seems to me, and the, uh, what Apple did in China, is that their whole argument, Apple's whole argument, was if we give you access to this phone, then other governments who are not as nice as the United States government will also ask us to do that. And if we refuse, then maybe they won't. Which, when you think about it, and when you look at the history of the last five years, it's crazy. There's, there's just no... Sorry, I, apparently there's a flash flood warning. Uh, so it, it's just crazy to think that uh, the Chinese government are waiting to see whether Apple gives access to the uh, phone to the United States government before they ask. If they want it, they will ask and they will get it. Uh, and so the Apple argument just made no sense. And then even the idea that they were trying to keep uh, uh, governments like China's from asking for it fell apart when you realized all the compromises that they had made already with China in terms of installing Chinese quote unquote encryption algorithms uh, uh, on their, uh, uh, in their phones, uh, uh, providing access to their uh, cloud and the like, and the other compromises they've made since. It's obvious that uh, they are not really effectively preventing uh, bad things from happening to the security of people's communications in China. If that's the case, well, then at least they could help protect Americans from crime. Uh, that's, to my mind, that's why we should be pressing Apple on this issue. The, you know, Apple made it sound as though if they did this, everybody would be able to read every communication, would be able to get access to every phone. Uh, but what the FBI was asking Apple to do is write a, an update program and send it to this phone. And the update program would defeat one of the security measures that prevented the FBI from getting into the phone. That's all they were asking to do. Uh, if you had defeated that mechanism across the board, maybe other people could have gotten into the phone, but they would have had to steal the phone too. Uh, and then they would have had to have a variety of sophisticated attack techniques. Um, so the, the ability to get access to the phone uh, was completely dependent on persuading Apple to give you that extra code. And if they had, uh, if you adopt a program, an, an approach like that, you're essentially saying no one will have access to this phone unless Apple decides to give them access to the phone. If Apple says our policy is to see a, a search warrant, then they will only do it when they see a search warrant. Um, that means that from the point of view of the user, you have to trust Apple. But if you don't trust Apple, you'd be crazy to be using their phone in the first place because they can write code today that gets into your phone and does something you didn't ask it to do. In fact, uh, I don't know, do you use Apple phones? You know what, that's literally leading into my next question, but I do not. <laughs> okay, I don't either, but, but I'm told that about hmm, four or five years ago, uh, uh, when they were trying to uh, get people to use Apple Music, uh, 
they sent everybody a U2 uh, album and downloaded it to their phone without telling them. And people were kind of upset. They said, well, this is my phone. Why is U2 suddenly on my phone? Uh, and Apple said, well, we thought you'd like it. Um, but what that demonstrated is Apple owns your phone. They can send anything to it. If they want to unlock your phone, they can just send a message to the phone and say, unlock yourself. I, I, and so since you're already trusting Apple not to do that, why don't you trust them to unlock the phone when the police have probable cause to believe that there's evidence of a crime on the phone? I, I strongly agree. And, and, and so that really, that really gets into my next question. So we, we've talked about the, our evolution of relationships with China, the evolution of tech firms' relationships with China, um, their, their influence, their outsized influence of um, you know, their market, using their market to influence mm -hmm. our culture and like our behavior, you know, how companies are responding to it. Some are okay, some are like, you know, hold on, you're, you're going too far. And, and earlier in, the, in, in, the, in, in, in our conversation, you mentioned that it's going to take protests and, and, you know, just an uproar from, from the everyday person to get any tech firm, whether they're friendly with China, whether they consider this, you know, uh, this, this bullying or not, is going to take everyday people to come up and say, NBA, sports, anyone, <laughs> yep. Sony, None of you all. I want none of you all to do this. And 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 aside from government action, um, what what can everyday people who are concerned about this issue do? Um, and I and I, I kind of want to add this in because I think it's very funny. I mean, the most hardened China hawks are not about to not get the Apple thirteen, the iPhone thirteen. <laughs> like, <laughs> Right. They are, you will fight them head to toe if you're like, maybe you should like, I don't know, get them, get a, get a, get a, anything, a Samsung, like, are we going back to Nokia? Like, I just don't know. Um, but you, you, you will be hard pressed to not go to Harvard or the University of Illinois, for example, and see their entire uh, libraries filled with Apple products. And, you know, I remember just previous jobs that gave me an iPhone as, as my work phone. And like, I, and I, I say all this to say that we are super critical and our, and our nation's vernacular is becoming super critical of China and of tech firms. And again, this crosses all party lines. This crosses regional beliefs, right? This, this goes from New York to the South, to Alabama, to California. But, you know, we're talking all of this and we are definitely still about to go, go to the Apple store on Christmas. Um, so what are everyday people actually supposed to do if they do care about foreign policy, if they do care about how U.S. companies behave abroad, um, when we have such close ties, and that's not even talking about trade with China. We're not even talking about trade with China. We're talking about, you know, this. So it, it, look, it's a, it's a, it, it's a, it takes a while. Uh, we've all, we've all had experiences where, you know, uh, our behavior didn't always match our best intentions. Uh, uh, it's the human condition. Uh, and we need to be reminded from time to time that, yeah, our choices do make a difference. Uh, and we need to play a role in reminding companies that we're watching their choices and we would prefer that they choose um, make products, make economic decisions that are better for freedom in the world than uh, contrary to freedom. Uh, and, you know, it, it's also something that you can raise with people you know who work for these companies. They are remarkably concerned about what their engineers think of them. Uh, and if their engineers say, you know, we're just really not comfortable with where we are with China, they will pay attention to that because they do not want to be a company that engineers don't want to work for. Uh, instead, unfortunately, the, the engineers are spending time uh, saying, I don't know if you're woke enough for me. Uh, uh, that, uh, I, would, I would prefer that they would do an assessment of where the threats lie in the world today of uh, the intolerance and bigoted behavior and genocide and and uh, instead of bringing up genocides from 1492, they ask about genocides that are occurring today and take action on it. 
felt like, I don't know, I feel like, I feel like I wish it wasn't COVID times or, I mean, I guess it's, it's, it's decreasing, but yeah. I feel like we could just keep talking. I feel like we could be friends. Ah, it's, this is, this is a lot of fun. I feel like I would get you like some scotch or gin, whatever it is you like. I feel like, anyway, um, so I, I like your line. I think it's my favorite is that human behavior doesn't always line with our be- align with our best intentions. And it really takes, you know, this effort on the part of people who care to remind people that actions matter. I feel like this is the same type of, you know, rhetoric and stirring up of feelings that we find when it comes to election season. Like, hi, guys, remember, your choices matter. These things matter. And like, yep. da, 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 da. Um, and, 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 and speaking of trying to figure out choices and, and how we can inspire people to move, this is a very American style debate because I think we care super heavily about our values. And, and I mean, we should, we, since the cold war, we spent all of this time, money, good and bad to be like, democracy is it. Um, but you know, I'm wondering what you think about a broader Western kind of liberal coalition to counter what we consider a threat. Um, so you know, we can definitely cite um, the EU's kind of resistance to taking Huawei off of their networks, or you know, um, a lot of our traditional allies feeling like you guys are trying to make your problem our problem, and we actually don't have a problem. Um, and in and, and some countries, some EU countries are you know coming around to that, um, but what role should the U.S. be playing, if at all, in trying to convince people that this is democracy, this is the same argument that we've been having, we need a Western coalition to kind of like fight back against this, and even us getting our own personal connections to EU citizens, trying to get them to remember like, hey, we should all care about this. You know, it, I we are doing that. We should do that. We kind of have to do that. Uh, if we wanted, if we want to have a market that is the same size as the market China controls, uh, we're not going to do it in North America alone. Uh, it, it, we're going to need, we're going to need uh, the contributions of countries like India and uh, uh, the European Union um, a, an agreement on some principles. It's enormously difficult. I, uh, I my, my book skating on stilts, I, I, I once said, well, it's a policy book that's sort of like a melodrama and the mustache twirling villain is the European Union. I, <laughs> I, so I've had plenty of conflict with them, um, but at the same time, we, we've got to find a way to, to keep those conflicts within bounds and to keep their eyes and ours focused on the broader areas where we agree. Uh, you know, China doesn't have any allies to speak of. Uh, and, and this is a big difference between the United States, which has a lot of allies and some quasi allies and some frenemies. Some frenemies. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, uh, and that's, it is frustrating. It means you can't get things done quickly. Um, every one of your allies has its own selfish interests that it wants to, to advance a little bit further before they agree to help you. Um, and so we've had 50 years of trying to make that work and mostly making it work with a lot of frustration. Um, if you want to see what the world is like, what, what people are like if they don't have allies, China is a good example. This is why I think they they have so pissed off the rest of the world. They don't have to worry about anybody's feelings except their own and their own uh, countrymen. Uh, and so they say, say things that are gobsmackingly uh, undiplomatic and impolitic. And uh, you know, I thought Americans were pretty gobsmackingly undiplomatic, but the Chinese, they've, they've institutionalized it. They call it wolf warrior uh, diplomacy. If there's a couple of uh, movies that, that are apparently worth seeing called Wolf Warrior, in which uh, uh, Chinese go out and fight Americans and uh, uh, defeat them uh, with uh, a wide variety of martial arts moves. Uh, and they, they say, these are wolf warriors. We want all of our ambassadors to be wolf warriors for China. And what that means is everybody else looks at them and says, yeah, you're, you're the wolf and I'm the lamb. I, and I don't 
you know, you don't make friends that way. So I think one, we have to do it in order to have the throw weight that we need to actually um, stand up to China. And two, frustrating and hard as it is on us, we're learning things and doing things that the Chinese will never learn as long as they have no allies. And uh, that is a strength that we don't re recognize. And, and you see it with the, uh, some of the stuff on uh, 5G, where we, the, we started out and, and all of our allies just said, yo, talk to the ham. I, you know, I, this stuff is too cheap for us not to buy. And bit by bit, country by country, slowly they've come around to say, oh, you know, maybe we need to have some more restrictions on what we buy and who we buy it from. Uh, and that's our policy working. We remember the frustration. We don't always remember that it actually tends to work in the long haul. Mm. You know, speaking of things tending to work in the long haul, I think that um, I've been very blessed to have, you know, good people and mentors in my life and blah, blah, blah. And there's just a couple of like truths that I always just tend to like, you know, stick with me. And I think one of them is that, you know, you can't go it alone. You, you need some type of someone. We are social creatures literally by nature. Um, so our allyship is very, very important. And while money can make you super happy, money can't literally buy everything all of the time. And, you know, I really do think that the allyship argument prevails, this is my personal opinion, that the allyship argument prevails um, in juxtaposition to the BRI argument, um, you know, of like, well, China has all of this, you know, trade and infrastructure and all these things that are going on with all the countries, um, especially like countries and continents that we've been avoiding, um, Latin America, Africa, you know, and I still truly believe that um, with, you know, kind of putting the rubber to the road and, 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 and being with our friends, that can outweigh the sizable amount of money that China is flowing into all of these other countries to try to like get them the you know flip sides and yeah I, there there and you know there are all kinds of, when you're a wolf warrior with a lot of money you tend to hand it out and then you expect people to do what you want um, and you don't uh, and people you know they take the money but when you tell them you expect them to do what you want they tend to resist that uh, and and I think. Across Africa, there's enormous infrastructure projects that the Chinese have paid for, uh, and a growing amount of uh, resentment at the way they built them, at what they expect, at how much interest they're charging, what kind of political influence they want. You know, they built the, uh, the uh, headquarters building. I think in Addis Ababa for the yep. Organization of African Unity. And oh, it was great. It was a gift from the people of China. They, they moved in and about a year later, they figured out that everything in the building was bugged. And they you were taking things for years. Yeah. Information for years. Just so I, you know, this, I, we, we have to be true to ourselves. We have some advantages in uh, who we're dealing with and their complete insularity, their assumption that, that uh, in the long run, they are going to run the show. Uh, a, and when you look at how much their neighbors hate them compared to how our neighbors just make jokes about us, I, I, I think we're in a better position uh, than, than they are. I can agree with you more. So I've, I've gotten some good lessons out of this. We got a couple of history lessons in. We got a couple of uh, good moral lessons in, a couple of good reminders. And um, I can't remember the, the, the uh, year, but I do think that it's worth noting that you were named one of the most tech savvy lawyers. Yes, yes, I, I was in the in the nineties, so ninety five or so, and I when people bring that up, I always say, uh, well, you got to consider the competition. <laughs> this is true. This is true. This is true. Um, but I really think that we have displayed. You have clearly displayed that your tech savviness has endured the decades. Thank I you. am very very grateful to have you on the podcast. I mean, we didn't even get to talk about supply chain, human rights issues. We didn't even kind of dive into policy things, but maybe that just means we are meant to continue this conversation. I, I, I'd love to do it. Uh, it was it was a delight. It was a great pleasure, Alexia. I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, I'll be back.